very much. Um, my name is James Pepper. Um, I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Uh, today is June 2nd, 2021, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. So I uh, don't have any remarks. Uh, I'm sorry I was late, um, and I'd like to just jump into the substance of the meeting. But before I do, um, could I have a motion to approve the minutes um, from our meeting on uh, 527? Uh, so moved. Seconded. OK, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And could I have a motion to approve the minutes from six our meeting on 6 1 2021? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. OK. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, a really important agenda today. Um, and we have a few guests with us. Um, our first uh, item on the agenda today is to do a walkthrough of Act 164 and S25. We have um, some of the lead sponsors and longtime uh, proponents um, of cannabis policy, tax and regulate with us here. I see um, Senator Sears um, and, you know, as far as um, someone who you know, went out on a limb and, you know, at a very, at a time when there was still so much stigma and uh, so much public um, disdain for cannabis and, and drug policy, you know, Senator Sears um, led an effort uh, along with the help of Michelle Childs and his committee to pass legislatively either the first or the second um, bill that ever passed the chamber of any state uh, legislature. Um, and we also have uh, Representative Copeland Hanses, who um, is the chair of the um, House GovOps Committee and in the leadership uh, of the House um, and just has been such a proponent um, of our board and really has put social equity, uh, public safety, um, youth safety um, at the forefront of cannabis policy. So we're very fortunate to have um, the two of you here. Um, and Michelle, um, what I would like to do if possible would be to, and Michelle Childs, I, you know, I thanked you, Michelle, in my opening remarks uh, at our uh, first meeting, just the, amount of hours and the amount of drafts that you've put into cannabis policy probably rivals any other issue that the state has had to deal with. Um, and so I just can't thank you enough for your commitment to this work. Um, and so uh, if you don't mind, Michelle, if you wouldn't, if you could walk us through some of the provisions <clears throat> of Act 164, kind of with an S25 overlay and help orient both the board members here and some of the um, people watching as to what the priorities of the bill are, you know, based on the legislative intent, um, some of our deadlines that we that we're going to have to meet, and um, just any of the kind of more nuanced issues that you think are relevant to to our work in the coming months. And um, what I've mentioned to um, what I've mentioned to our board members is that you are not our uh, general counsel, you're not our, our attorney. Um, we need to shy away from asking Michelle questions that might lead her to be giving us legal advice um, or that might um, disrupt her attorney-client privilege. Um, but Senator Sears and Representative Copeland Hanses, um, if you don't mind, um, if questions come up as they arise, maybe we could, you know, lean on you a little bit for why certain decisions were made or kind of um, what, what the thinking was maybe behind some of these provisions. Yeah, and also I want to mention Senator Pearson from Agriculture and Finance has been instrumental in the past. Yeah, I totally agree. I actually invited him here. I think I actually He's maybe here. do see him. He's yeah. here, I saw him. 
Yeah, it, and I would absolutely agree with that. And he's been, he was one of the original sponsors of Act 164 and S25 and really did a lot of um, the behind the scenes work uh, for the conference committee that got Act 164 across the finish line. So uh, do you all want to say, you know, can I turn it maybe to you, Senator Sears, first, just to say a few words um, on this issue and then maybe go to so Copeland, Representative Copeland Hans and then Senator Pearson? First, I want to thank you for having me, but I also want to just say um, Michelle has been great. I mean, I started working on this during the Shumlet administration, and uh, you uh, were a, a member of that. You were his lead, one of his chief aides, and we worked together on that bill that died in the House, unfortunately. Um, and I look at what would have happened. I think the most outstanding figure that I keep in mind is the RAND report and the number of Vermonters who use marijuana on a regular basis. And, um, that's what really led me to support the bill. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you had um, 70,000 to 80,000 Vermonters doing something um, that's illegal, um, you know, that it needed to change. And we were, uh, we were fortunate to have uh, you, Governor Shumlin, but also Michelle, really, is an expert in all this. Um, you know, she can, I often ask her for help with um, constituent questions about when can I open my shop, that sort of thing. I do appreciate all her effort as well as yours early on. Well, thank you. You've certainly been a leader in this. Um, Representative Copeland Hanses, would you mind just saying a few words? Um, hello, good morning, and uh, thanks for having me today. Um, big thanks to Senator Sears for his persistence uh, in sending us uh, tax and regulate bill, and uh, big thanks to Senator Pearson, former Representative Pearson, for being a, a collaborator along the way. Uh, we had a much a uh, longer path to take in building consensus in the House. And um, Michelle has been along with us every step of the way, drafting so many amendments. She probably <laughs> knows how to unravel this bill in her sleep. Um, but uh, but special thanks to the Senate for, for continuing to, to press and, and uh, understanding that uh, it took us a little bit longer over in the unwieldy house to to bring people along, but I feel like we're in a really good place right now. It's exciting to see the board um, get up and and uh, starting along these these initial steps. And uh, so I'm glad to be here today. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Pearson. Are you willing to say a few words? Sure. Good morning. Thanks for including me. Um, I guess I would just heap. Uh, add some additional praise to Michelle and, and say not just the work uh, that brings the board together, but also decriminalizing, expungement, you know, the whole suite of, of uh, criminal justice reform that as it relates to cannabis, uh, she has been there. I've been proud to play a small role and, and really look forward to the work uh, you all are, are taking on here. I think it's important. It's exciting. Uh, it's timely. It's, you know, uh, not a casual endeavor, and I hope we do it thoughtfully. Um, but uh, we have lost time, as, as folks have commented, so hope we can also be expedient and glad to help you think through any piece or answer questions as they come up. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Michelle, you know, you've done this a number of times. I don't know for how many different committees this bill has actually touched, but um, I, would I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I would just leave it to your experienced hand um, on this, uh, just knowing that we don't have a, a lot of time. You know, I know sure. an hour is not, I'm going to try to keep things to an hour and then let, let you all go. Um, so I, I turn it over to you and I've I've. So I've allowed the board to ask questions along the way, so long as, you know, under the parameters that I had already mentioned. Um, and we're going to try to not derail the conversation by going too far down any one kind of piece of this. OK, great. Um, so thank you, everybody, for all the, the nice 
things you said. I, I appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure working with all of you. And I'm psyched to continue working with James, with the chair, um, after all our work on this through the years. Um, so I probably should have done a little homework on sharing on Microsoft Teams. I'm not used to doing it on this, so I need a little guidance from Nellie. I, what I did is I created a document that I hope will be helpful and not too confusing. But um, as you know, Act 164 has is quite large. And there's things that you know you don't need me to walk you through, and plenty of it that you can look at on your own. Um, so, what I've done is I took S25 and I kind of overlaid parts of S25 that I thought were important for you guys to take a look at to figure out how you're going to divvy up the workload and look at your timelines. Um, and I overlaid that on Act 164, and then I highlighted some area, particular areas in Act 164 and N25 that the chair said he'd like to focus a little more on. And so I wanted to just kind of walk you through that. So people, cause I think just talking about it in general without looking at the language is a little tough because there's so much there. So um, Nellie, can you just let me know where I share my screen or share my document? Uh, yeah, next up at the top of your screen next to the mute button, there should be a little uh, button. It's a rectangle with an upwards pointing arrow. So if you click that um something should pop up telling you your options to share oh yes i see that um uh, sorry for taking All right, I'm have I can so I have the document up, but I'm having a little trouble accessing it on the screen there. Um, hmm. Nelly, can you just pop it up? Yep, I can absolutely do that. Give me one second. Or do you know like why I wouldn't be able to see it when I do the screen share? Like you can't see this now when I'm looking at it. You don't see it, right? Yeah, I, we I, see, I, it. see it. Oh, you do see it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, great. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, and so I can't see all of y'all, but I'm sure there's a way that I do that. I just minimize it, maybe. Uh, I guess if you have questions, let me know because I can't. I I should have figured out how to use the Microsoft. So just pipe up if you need something. So um, so what everybody should be looking at, and I sent it to Nellie, so I'm sure she'll have it posted on the CCB website, um, is the act from last year um, with some provisions of S25 in there. Um, I put a little note on there just that it's this is not like any kind of official draft, and I didn't include all of S25 into this, but just the things that I thought that would be important to the control board at this point. Um, so just a little just set up and talking about it is that so currently we have cannabis addressed in Title 18 as the health chapter, I mean the health uh, title, and you have it in the medical cannabis chapter, and then you also have it in the regulated drug chapter. You also you have hemp in Title 6. So one of the things that this did is kind of taking a cannabis there's still the criminal provisions that are in 18 and for now the medical provisions in 18 but the medical will shift over on march 1st of next year um is create putting this in title seven so uh, and retitling that to be alcoholic beverages cannabis and tobacco so it, it being a regulated product rather than firmly in the criminal laws and only in the criminal laws which is how it's been dealt with obviously for decades um so we're working in title seven primarily um, and I'm just going to move through the draft and and just highlight some of the things that that I talked about. So I'm going to skip a lot of it. Um, I think everybody who's on the board is already familiar with the the nominating process and and all of that kind of a thing. So I'm going to move down um, first to section 843 on the CCB and the duties. Um, and so just something to mention and um, is about the that it's created in the executive branch as an independent commission. Um, and the duties you'll see in subsection B, there's rulemaking, there's administration of the program, 
for cannabis establishments, um, which are their commercial adult use, as well as the administration of the cannabis medical cannabis registry and for uh, dispensaries that would be licensed um, to serve patients. There's also the submission of an annual, annual budget to the um, to the governor. So that's pretty standard for like, if you look at creation of new entities, they have these kind of general duties. Um, membership of the board, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that unless you have specific questions, um, but they're three-year terms, um, the chair and two members. Um, there is a change in this section I just wanted to note. Um, it's a very small change. It's, I really viewed it as technical is that the, um, because the board is an independent entity, the way that it's structured, which is similar to the Green Mountain Care Board, is that the members of the, of the board can be removed only for cause by the remaining members of the commission. Um, and, uh, and so you'll see the language in red, I've highlighted in red language that came over from S25, is that the board is to adopt rules uh, pursuant to the APA to define the basis and the process for removal. So I think that that was kind of assumed when Act 164 was, was originally uh, drafted and passed. And I think this is just clarifying that that's something that the board will need to do uh, is, to is to do that for the removal process. Um, there are provisions for conflicts of interest in subsection D. Again, these are based uh, largely on what we have in law for other entities. Again, looking to the Green Mountain Care Board on conflicts, um, sets forth the salaries. Page nine, subsection F, uh, the designation of an executive director um, who's required to be an attorney with legislative or regulatory experience. Um, and then the duties of the executive director. And I know you guys have been working hard to interview and get ready to hire an executive director who's gonna be very busy this summer. They have, the board has the ability to hire consultants. So you see subsection G. Subsection H is the advisory committee. The advisory committee are folks uh, in the community who are experts in various fields. Um, who can really help the board with its policy issues. Um, you'll see at the top of page 10, the red language is uh, new from 25, that the board's to collaborate with the advisory committee, uh, committee on any recommendations to the legislature, of which there are many to be made in the next year or so. Um, S25 also increased the uh, members of the board from 12 to 14 and changed one of the existing members, which is you'll see on subdivision F, um, originally in 164, it was a member with expertise in substance misuse prevention and the Senate Committee on Committees would appoint. That's been changed to the chair of the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. Um, and then there is a change to I so that the municipal appointment would be from the Senate Committee on Committees. And then the two new members are on page 11 on subdivisions M and N. So you have the chair of the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee or designee. And so that is an existing committee, as you know, there's going to be kind of a changeover because that committee gets repealed next year when the uh, Title 18 medical laws um, are repealed and the new ones come in, but we'll talk about a little later in this, in this uh, document about what the kind of new version of that oversight committee will be. Um, and then subdivision N is a member appointed by the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. And so that is the professional organization of the current dispensaries of which there are five. There's also a change to the date for the appointment for the advisory committee. So it was originally to be May 1st. That's been changed to July 1st. Um, so I'm going to skip over criminal background checks. I'll talk a little next about, about the fund. So the Cannabis Regulation Fund is, is composed of all of the fees that are collected by the board. Um, and so, uh, so anything with regard to application fees, license fees, renewal fees um, for all three programs, so for the medical, for the dispensary, and for the adult use, all of those fees will be going into the fund. And it's this fund um, that, uh, that resources the Cannabis Control Board. So um, the, the 
board operates on and all the regulatory system operates on fees collected and operates out of this fund, all the tax money goes elsewhere. So um, there are provisions in the act that talk about if the fund runs at a deficit, so you're not collecting enough fees to be doing all the things that the board needs to be doing, then there's a provision to backfill the fund with some tax revenues, but the goal is to have the fees be covering the administration of the program. Um, that's the way that the uh, that the current medical program uh, has been running, and they haven't been receiving any separate um, uh, appropriations, and they've been operating off of fees. But I think there's a lot of questions now because there's a lot of uh, we're not really sure how everything's going to look um, about whether or not you can meet your policy goals of having affordable fees um, so that you're moving as much of the illegal market into the regulated market. And so you wanna, you're gonna be very calculating about how you uh, establish your fees and you don't wanna make them too high because then you can't get people in. And so um, I think there's still a question out there about whether or not all of the board's work can be supported strictly by fees. Um, so eight, section 846, um, just your authority to be able to collect the fees. Section 847 is an appeals process. Um, again, this is modeled after other provisions in law um, with administrative agencies. So a person who uh, is aggrieved by a decision of the board can within 30 days appeal the decision to an appellate officer the board has the ability to contract for appellate officer services, so it doesn't have to necessarily be someone who, um, who is a full-time employee of the board. Um, and then Section 847 just sets out the process. Again, it's very similar to what is, is in law for appeals process um, and with other agencies. Um, you have on subsection B the basis for um, for decisions about um, in which the hearing officer could decide that there was an error with regard to the board's decision. And then there is the ability for uh, the party to appeal the appellate officer's decision to the Supreme Court. Michelle, I've got a just quick oh. question about that. If you don't mind, sure. this, is, this is Pepper. Um, the um, the appellate court, the Supreme Court standard of review, is that just a de novo? Is that, do you know, or do they have the kind of same like abuse of discretion? It's on the record. Okay, so they, they would look at the record fresh? The records from the board, yep. It wouldn't be de novo. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so next, I'm going to move on to section five, and we are on page 15. And um, so this was kind of a catch-all um, reporting section for Act 164. And I will show you that here at the very beginning, this has already changed, and this is having to do with the fees and the reporting. So originally in 164, um, the board was supposed to come back before the legislature uh, by April 1st of this year uh, and uh, basically put forth, you know, requested resources for FY 22 and 23, including positions and funding. Um, you'll see that 23 was kind of struck, um, you know, trying to just acknowledge uh, the issues here around timing and the late start of the board. Um, also, what struck there uh, is all the reporting with regard to fees, and I'll come back around to that after I go through the other language because there's a this has obviously been replaced by something new in S25. But looking at the reporting requirements um, that you do have still in here, and obviously the dates uh, are passed, and so going to be um, up to you about when you get those recommendations into the uh, over to the General Assembly. So, but um, there was supposed to be a report uh, April 1st um, after consultation with Secretary of ANR uh, and Agriculture, Food and Markets uh, recommending to the General Assembly specific uh, exemptions or criteria or additional requirements under state or local law 
uh, around environmental and land use uh, for cannabis establishments. And the recommendations are required to address whether additional groundwater quality requirements are required for the cultivation of cannabis. Um, the executive director can provide the recommendations based on a tier type or category of cannabis cultivation or cannabis establishment. And so, you know, one of the things that's in Act 164, as well as S1, S25, is the recognition um, from, this, from the General Assembly's position of, of looking at small cultivators as perhaps their own category that may not have, you know, the same need to be regulated in the same way as larger cultivation operations. And so this is where uh, the recommendations from the board can take into consideration all the different types of licensees in there when they are recommending um, the rules around environmental and land use issues. Um, so subsection C is something similar, but it applies to energy and efficiency requirements. So again, the report was due on April 1st, and the board is to consult with uh, Commissioner of uh, Public Service and the Chair of the PUC on recommending energy or efficiency requirements or standards for the operation of cannabis establishments. Um, and then you'll see there the things that they're to, to, uh, to report on around building energy standards, um, recommended energy audits, and energy efficiency and conservation uh, measures. Subsection D is saying that in the two reports above, um, the executive director is to be considering and recommending what types of permits or licenses or standards that uh, cannabis cultivators or product manufacturers are, need to demonstrate as a condition of licensure. And so this is, you know, one of the things is as people are entering the market and looking at getting licensed, you know, there's going to be, you know, they're still going to, because they're not exempt from um, land use laws, things like that, they're going to have to figure out, you know, what types of permits at the state and local level are they going to need? And so this was added in there to, um, to kind of help licensees understand, you know, kind of all the the I's they get a dot and the T's they get a cross in order to be in compliance with all of the energy and the environmental roles. Hi, Michelle. It's Kyle. Yep. I just had a, a quick question for you. Sure. So uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that, um, you know, cannabis manufacturers or, and growers are going to be considered a commercial product and not necessarily an agricultural product. And I know that there is some language in here around certain RIPs, um, that they will have to abide by even though they're not technically an agricultural product but I, and without jumping down a rabbit hole i was i was wondering if you could help um myself and other folks on the phone understand the intent behind designating the growing of um you know cannabis as a commercial product instead of an agricultural product i have my suspicions on why that that uh, designation was made but just for the the good of the group michelle if that goes too far down attorney client privilege maybe senator pearson you know might i think that's a, yeah that's not really a question for me but for the for for the uh elected officials so great sorry keep me straight that's okay do you, do you want me to jump in and give you my shot or please that, that would be um, great. i i would say um you know they, they're folks want it was a political decision by some who were not wanting to confer some of the tax benefits uh, and have it uh, just be very open in terms of land use, et cetera. They, they, they wanted more control. They, they Folks talked openly about, particularly if you had an indoor grow that suddenly was considered agriculture and there was no ability to have zoning or anything, look at the buildings, uh, as, just as an example. Um, so it was that sort of discomfort. Uh, and obviously, we are quite permissive with what farms can do. Um, and folks were not eager to just hand that over to to this new industry. Um, I think, you know, I would say for me, I, I, that seemed like a reasonable compromise. But um, something that I hope we can move towards. I mean, I think out of the gate, maybe we want to understand it and and start to see what the landscape looks like. 
um, and then potentially peel back and recognize that it is an agricultural crop. So I don't know if that helps, but taxes and land use is the is the two, you know, simple, straightforward answers. Thank you, Senator Pearson. Uh, I, Appreciate it. I, I just want to, I was in a minority of perhaps one on this, but um, Senator Pearson has outlined the reasons, but I still think we could have done notwithstanding language to allow it to be an agricultural product similar to hemp. Um, and that, that was, I think that will create confusion down the road and it's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, but I, uh, I agree that there was a political compromise, um, but I, you know, and I understand the concern about zoning and other regulations. Uh, but uh, still, I think I think we'll be looking at that in the future. Thank you, Senator Sears. Okay, so I'm going to um, pick up with subsection E, um, bottom of page 18. Um, and so this is a requirement uh, for the board reporting to the General Assembly about whether or not cannabis product manufacturers and dispensaries should be considered food manufacturing establishments or food processors under Title 18 for purposes of licensing by DOH. So um, Department of Health currently does not inspect uh, dispensaries that are uh, developing uh, cannabis products for their patients. Dispensaries have asked for that and Department of Health has declined and said that they don't fit within this. Um, and so this would be looking for a recommendation to the General Assembly about whether or not there should be specific legislation um, clarifying that if you are producing uh, food products, uh, regardless of whether or not they have cannabis in them, that you uh, should fall under those regulations and be regulated by the Department of Health. Subsection F, um, this is the advertising uh, study, which um, is kind of a moot point at this at this juncture. And I don't, uh, it's, you know, we're already running short on time, so I'm just gonna speed through the advertising stuff. But essentially there was a disagreement between the House and the Senate on advertising um, and uh, House wound up passing a, a complete ban. Senate would not agree to that in conference. And so they were looking to the Cannabis Control Board and working with the Attorney General's office to come back with a proposal. Um, because of the, um, the, the missed deadline, um, they wanted, the General Assembly wanted to get something in place on advertising so that you didn't have nothing. So there wasn't just blank on advertising as you were going into accepting applications um, next spring. And so there's advertising language that was in S25 that I'll go over with you in a few. Um, so subsection G is on or before next January. Um, the board is to report um, to the General Assembly, a summary of its work with uh, labor, ACCD, and DOC, and Director of Racial Equity on developing outreach training and employment programs focused on providing economic opportunities to individuals who have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. And also a summary of the experience of other jurisdictions with regulated cannabis markets that allow retail cannabis establishments to accept online ordering for store pickups and delivery. And the uh, you know pros and cons of doing something like that in Vermont. Also uh, recommending um, whether the General Assembly should consider adding additional types of cannabis licenses. So you know a lot of folks have been talking about a craft cooperative license. Then there's the possibility of a delivery license, special event license, cafe license, um, you know, whether or not Vermont should expand. Um, also, subdivision four recommendations, whether cannabis and cannabis products should have a minimum amount of CBD uh, in them. And then subdivision five recommendations regarding the display and sale of cannabis related paraphernalia that is sold by persons who are not licensed as cannabis establishments or dispensaries. And so that is the that it's kind of a, uh, it's not really straight up in your wheelhouse. It's the issue of if you were walking into a convenience store and they have, you know, uh, pipes and bongs and things like that displayed in a case that you can buy at a convenience store, um, but they wouldn't be licensed under the CCB, um, uh, how that should be addressed if, 
if any way differently than it is currently. Um, so new language section 4A, um, this is what replaced the language on the reporting on fees for April 1st. So because of the timeline, um, it's been reworked that now the board is to report on or before October 1st um, on recommendations instead of to the General Assembly as a whole to Ways and Means Finance and the Committees on Government Operations on the fees. And so, um, as you know, there were no specific fees set in either bill. Um, that's left to the board to, to determine because there's a certain level of uh, complexity and information that you need, obviously, to decide you know, how big is your market and then dividing that up into how many acres can be grown and how many licenses out of those acres and things like that. You're required to do tiering on at a minimum, the cultivator licenses and the retailer licenses, but you can do tiering for others. And so there's so many different um, possibilities there. You could have a micro cultivator license along with a micro retail and micro product manufacturer and bundle that, and that could be a license. So there's a lot of different options there and how you wanna go. And so that you would be recommending the fees to the general, to these committees in the fall. Um, and so here's just the list of all the fees. And then, um, and then what's been discussed uh, in committee was that uh, the hope is that those committees would be able to uh, meet and discuss the proposal in the fall in order to prepare for the legislative session. So if you come with your with your recommendations to those committees in the fall, they work with them, then they can work with me to create a bill that can be introduced um, right off the bat in January. And then the hope would be that they um, would be able to enact that and um, have the fees established um, upon passage uh, so that when you start accepting applications in the spring, they would be there. Um, it also, at least through receiving your recommendations in October, gives applicants a general idea of the ballpark figures that, um, that are being recommended and that are likely to be implemented. Michelle, what's the kind of maximum amount of decision making that could happen uh, with those recommendations? Could the committees write a letter of support to the to the relevant, you know, to the speaker and to the pro tem? Sure, nothing would prevent them from doing that. Um, you know, they can get behind a certain proposal and, you know, say that that's their intent to move forward with that legislation. But, you know, once it's introduced, it's all just you know, see how, see how it goes. But certainly if you have, I think the committees of jurisdiction all behind a particular proposal, you know, and as well as the leadership, right? then okay. you could have a certain amount of reliability there. Okay. Um, so page 22, uh, there's, here's some additional reporting requirements that, that they didn't fit in on uh, Act 164. So these two new ones are on or before November 1st of this year. Um, the first one is recommendations as to whether integrated licensees and product manufacturers should be permitted to produce solid concentrate products with greater than 60% THC for purposes of integrating it into a product that would at the end product stage be in compliance with what can be sold, but it's at, at the kind of the production stage, it has a higher THC. So we'll go over in a few minutes, the prohibited products. Um, and then the second one is recommendations developed in consultation with ag, whether the board should permit hemp or CBD to be converted to Delta nine, and if so, how it should be regulated. Section 4C are the addition of two new positions, the exempt general counsel position and a classified administrative assistant. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip through a lot of this. I will just note, I'm not gonna go over the advertising, but section seven on the definition of cannabis establishments, you have your new definitions of advertising and advertisement um, and what's included, what isn't included. 
So I just wanted to highlight those. Um, Regulation by local government, so page 30. Um, so I think everybody's pretty familiar with this. There was one uh, tiny technical amendment to this section in S25, and that's just a clarification on the that when you're talking about requiring towns to have an affirmative vote on allowing retail sales, it's applying to a cannabis retailer or the retail portion of an integrated licensee. Remember, the re so integrated licensees are they're vertically integrated the way the dispensaries are now. So they may have a grow facility in a place where they have their general operations and they cultivate and they have their product manufacturing base, but maybe their retail point of sale is in another town. So um, it wouldn't apply to the whole operation, just onto the retail portion. Um, and this is just the section in 164 that says that prior to there being retail sales in a town, that the town has to put it on the ballot and have an affirmative vote to do so. And then it would stay that way unless there is a similar vote to repeal that, that decision. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, for dispensaries that already or, or towns that already have dispensaries in them for the retail portion, would they they will have to be approved through a town vote um, as well? Like they in order so in not that, for dispensaries. For, so, this is only applying to the adult use retail sales. Okay. All right, just wanted and, to make sure I understood that. Yep. So dispensaries would be exempt from that. They don't, there's no similar um, provision in the dispensary chapter. Okay. Michelle, yep. can, you, can you go back up to sub B in this? I mean, I, mean, I think sure. this is an area of pretty intense litigation in other states. Um, is, is this based on our kind of liquor model? Um, the kind yes. of community host agreement, essentially, and the community host boards, the local cannabis commissions? Yeah, I wouldn't use that term because we don't want to confuse with what's going on in, or what has gone on in Massachusetts. But mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, uh, this is just so that the way that a local municipality may have a, basically use their select board as their local liquor control board and issue any local permits. Um, and that's based on whatever the General Assembly has given them as authority in Title 24 to be able to regulate um, things like signs and public nuisances. Um, and they could issue permits at the local level to do that. They, they're not required to do it. They still have to, you know, everybody's got to be in compliance with the state law. And some towns maybe may choose not to do anything at the local level. but. Um, this is just to clarify that they can do that and that you have to be in compliance with your any local requirements and local permits for the good of your state license. Um, Representative Copeland Hans is maybe you're a better person to ask, um, but Michelle, I certainly would defer to you as well. Do you have any thinking about the timing of that? Do, you know, is, is this up to the board to decide whether or not we want this local license? Uh, prior to the application, or is this kind of a once their application has been approved, then they go get a local control license? I guess it would it would be my expectation that um, that the local control license would uh, would be required prior to a state license. I think that was okay. sort of the intent that folks were uh, were going for in the house when we had these discussions. OK, thank you. So if you look at subsection C, it addresses that issue that oh. that you raised. And I think the the thing that's going to be obviously tricky is at the startup, you know, the question is, well, maybe they haven't gotten that process. And so if you have people, so they've taken a vote and they've approved it, but yet you, and so somebody has applied for a state license, but they're still in the process of trying to figure out what they're going to doing at the local level. You know, at the beginning, you may run into some issues there, but um, I think it's just, you know, if, if, if there's a system set up at the local level and things are required, then they do that. And if they're, they haven't gotten it together yet, then that's an issue that the board will have to look at about, you know, if you once you grant a state license, if they then the locals then add that requirement, how do you 
kind of follow up on that. Um, so section 864 is just the new advertising section. Um, and uh, it's pretty comprehensive. It's, I mean, I think I haven't done a, a good look at all the advertising stuff lately with new states coming online, but I would say it's, you know, one of the more, uh, you know, restrictive um, ones out there, um, particularly because of what you have at the top of page 33 in subsection C, cannabis establishments are not permitted to advertise their products via any medium unless the licensee can show that not more than 15% of the audience is reasonably expected to be under 21 years of age. So that's modeled after um, provisions with a, with a different formula, but in Colorado and California. So, you know, a lot of people express concern that there's going to be, you know, big billboards and signs. I mean, although we don't have those in Vermont anyway, but, you know, those kinds of things are just not really uh, contemplated by the scheme at all. Um, so uh, subsection D, I'll just mention the advertisements have to contain health warnings adopted by rule by the board in consultation with the Department of Health. So there's a lot of provisions in 164 that address where the board is to be working with Department of Health on warnings and labeling. Um, so uh, there's also a process in subsection E for advertisement review. The fees, there was a fee in Act 164 for advertising reviews. Um, that fee was removed in House Ways and Means in S25 this year. So, um, so there are uh, so there are no fees associated with the advertising review. So that'll be something that the board will need to contemplate about building into the rest of the fee structure, um, because you are going to have to review all advertisements prior to their publication. Can I ask a quick question? Is that per advertisement or per advertisement type, depending on the organization retail operation that is putting forward a proposed advertisement? It says all advertisements. And I think if I would look at the definition of that, um, I mean, again, I'm not really supposed to be interpreting at this stage now that it's left the state house, but um, uh, so maybe I should just leave. I think that's probably for y'all to, to discuss. Um, um, so education, um, this is a requirement that licensees complete an enforcement seminar every three years that's conducted by the board. And I'm just sorry, I'm just going to speed up because we're on page 34 of 115 pages. So I'm trying to go as fast as I can. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, so this is just making sure that licensees uh, have well-trained employees, that they know what the law is, they know what the requirements are, things like this. Again, looking to you know, Department of Liquor, other other uh, state agencies that that do this sort of thing to say, you know, let's make sure that we're we're providing enough information to make sure that our licensees are in compliance. Um, Section 866 is youth provisions. These are really kind of um, this is taking all the little youth provisions and uh, throughout the act and putting them all under one section. So it's really kind of belts and suspenders. It's all, these provisions are elsewhere in the act, but here's just one place. So just going over and reviewing that, you know, it's the age of 21, you can't make any purchases unless you're 21. That's the age for possession in Vermont. Um, and the board has the ability to assess civil penalties or suspend or revoke licenses of establishments that sell um, to, uh, to under 21. Um, under 21s are not allowed in the cannabis uh, establishment, so they can't even come in the door. So uh, a lot of folks who have been to them in other states, you get carted at the door. So it's that sort of thing. Um, and then subsection C, this is one of the provisions where the board is consulting the Department of Health on rules regarding packaging and um, labeling and products and things like that um, to try to keep it out of the hands of under 21s. Um, and then subsection D is just mentioning the new advertising provision that was added in S25. Page 36, prohibited products. So this was um, added in the House in Act 164, and there's a list of products that are not permitted to be sold by a cannabis 
establishment under this particular for adult use. So this doesn't, these prohibited products don't apply to dispensaries. And that's one of, so the, in the, in Act 164, I'm not going to go through that section, but there's a list in Act 164 of the things that dispensaries can do that adult use retailers and integrated licensees cannot do things like delivery and, and that sort of thing. Um, and this is one of the things too, is that they can, dispensaries can sell products that are prohibited in the adult use market. And so right now under this, there's a cap of 30% THC for flour, a uh, cap of 60% for solid concentrates, um, you can't do uh, oils unless they're prepackaged, like as a vape. Um, you can't do flavored oils um, unless it's something that's like a naturally occurring kind of flavor or aroma in the flower. Um, so if you had a lemon haze variety, that's fine, but you can't add anything to make it more appealing from a flavor perspective. Um, you can't combine cannabis and um, nicotine or alcohol. Um, and then there's a prohibition on certain on cannabis products and packaging that are designed to be appealing to uh, under 21. Uh, top of page 37, this is the cultivation of cannabis environmental and land use standards. Um, I think I'm just going to, again, I'm trying to just get through all of it so you can just kind of see everything that's here. I mean, I think we already talked about it a little bit is, you know, cannabis establishments are not considered farming under this act. Um, and so, uh, so it, they do have to comply with um, environmental land use rules. Um, so there are uh, there are some small e exceptions um, with regard to the uh, current use and ability to carve out a small amount um, for a small cultivator where they could include that in the current use program. So that subsection that's uh, in subdivision A two, um, and then you'll see subsection B has to comply with all state, federal, and local environmental energy or public health law unless otherwise provided. Um, subsection D is the bit that I think that Kyle mentioned about thinking about like the compliance with RAPs and so that sets forth those requirements. Moving on to rulemaking. So rulemaking is obviously this uh, really big task for the board this summer. Section 881 lays out all the possible things that you would need to address through rulemaking. It's organized in subdivisions so that like the first subdivision is rules concerning any cannabis establishment. And um, for brevity, I'm just, I'm not gonna go through those, but you can see all the different types of things that, that have to be uh, addressed. Everything from when you're talking about the all licensees, you're talking about what are the requirements for licensure? What are the forms to look like? What do you need to submit in terms of your operating plan? Uh, what type of business organization do you have? Uh, where is your capital coming from? Um, all of that kind of stuff. So there's all the business sort of stuff. Um, then uh, you get down to more specific things on inspection requirements, uh, employment and training, security requirements, health and safety, um, so long list there, and then it moves into on, and then you'll see the new at the bottom, uh, their subdivision R's advertising and marketing. Um, so some, you'll need to do some rulemaking kind of fleshing out some of the, the more nuanced details of advertising based on what they've established in statute. Subdivision two addresses the cultivators and um, license licenses, uh, subdivision three for product manufacturers, you know, and, and within all of these things, there are some guidelines for you around things like, like for product manufacturers, they say single packet of cannabis product, you know, can't contain more than 50 milligrams of THC and then has some exceptions. So there are some specific things that they kind of direct you in, in terms of the policy there. Others sure, are broader. Can I Sorry. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a, vision that you know I had highlighted in my own notes that I think are, is important and I just want to ask the representatives and the senators here if, if I'm reading it correctly if you go up just one page to 
Um, it says the board shall consider different needs and risks of small cultivators. I'm looking right there at uh, big B, big subdivision B. Um, so obviously there's certain um, standards that we can't waive, uh, you know, pesticides, health warnings, things like that. But am I reading this correctly that um, we can create some of looser standards for small cultivators when adopting rules? Was that the thinking behind this section? Um, either Senator Sears, Sen uh, Representative Copeland Hanses, or uh, Senator Pearson? Uh, I'll jump in and say yes. Um, you know, we recognize that the the scale of an operation for a small cultivator um, uh, might give them, a, you know, a different ability to invest in, uh, you know, certain pieces of infrastructure. And so, um, we are going to rely on you to, uh, you know, to explore. Uh, you know how to follow the you know the safety and security protocols but also scale them in a way that makes it possible for small cultivators to get into the market without having to install the same level of um, you know security systems that you might for a large indoor grow operation for instance yeah thank you I, it just is an important piece of this i just wanted to make sure i was reading it correctly Hey, James, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you that there's going to be some stuff we, we can't waive, but are you kind of referring to what's what's directly above big subsection B when it comes to all the, the paperwork and everything else that also might be associated with, with submitting an application? That's that you're right. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. I think it's important to recognize that there are groups of people who currently are growing small amounts of marijuana um, and we our desire is to bring them out of the black market into the retail market and um, there may need to be accommodations to help them do that right yeah exactly it seems like a very powerful provision of the bill i just wanted to make sure that that was the thinking behind it was the the small cultivators and, and bringing them into the regulated market yeah i, I agree you. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip down to page 45 and I just highlighted subsection B here, which I know you're already doing, um, which is just the direction that the board just consult with other state agencies and departments as necessary in development and adoption of the rules for their shared expertise and duties. Um, Okay, next, um, so page 47, licenses. This is just a section that's gonna set forth, um, you know, all the general provisions for the six different types of licenses. Um, you'll see the licenses mentioned there in subsection D, subdivision two, uh, as I had already mentioned, requires um, that you adopt tiers for cultivators and retailer licenses, but that you can do it for others. Um, uh, one thing just to, to clarify for the crowd or people watching is that, you know, just to reiterate that uh, folks are only entitled to hold a maximum of one type of each type of license. Um, so it's, uh, you can't have someone who has three retail licenses or anything like that. So there's a maximum of one. Um, uh, and then there's the potential of having the, the integrated if dispensaries choose to opt into the integrated system and have that vertical vertically integrated uh, one. Um, so uh, let's see, I don't know if there's anything in particular in here, Pepper, that you wanted me to cover. Um, no, no, that I know one. Just mentioned actually was the one that I had highlighted. The, the one okay, license. all right. Um, okay, uh, so priorities in business and technical assistance, section 903. Um, so the General Assembly established certain priorities um, uh, that they want the board to include as priorities as you're developing them by rule. Um, they include whether applicants have an existing dispensary license in good standing whether the applicants would foster social justice and equity in the cannabis industry, whether applicants propose specific plans to recruit, hire, and implement development ladders for minorities, women, or individuals who have been disproportionately impacted by prohibition, 
uh, whether applicants propose specific plans to pay a living wage and offer benefits to their employees, uh, whether the project incorporates principles of environmental resiliency or sustainability, including energy efficiency, and the geographic distribution of cannabis establishments based on population and market needs. That's something that is kind of brought over from the existing dispensary program where to kind of look at geographic distribution um, for, the, for the licensees. Um, subsection B is ACCD in collaboration with AG is to provide business and technical assistance to Vermont applicants with priority for services based on criteria adopted by the board. Um, and then you remember in, in that earlier section five, there was the discussion about reporting on that. Um, so that ties into the subsection B. Um, subsection C, no later than September 1st this fall, the board shall begin working with labor, ACCD, DOC, and Director of Racial Equity to develop outreach training and employment programs focused on providing economic opportunities to individuals who have been disproportionately affected by prohibition. Um, I'm going to move now on to small cultivators, so section 904. Um, so this was just an intense uh, statement from the General Assembly, um, as Senator Sears mentioned, trying to move as much of the illegal market into the regulated market, recognizing that, you know, in order to do that, you can't make the um, administrative hurdles so big that people won't do it. And so um, you're gonna have to be working on trying to find the sweet spot there um, to try to get folks into the regulated market. And so, um, you know, it's subsection A and furtherance of the goals of Bork shall consider policies to promote small cultivators and small cultivators being a thousand square feet. Um, so the application for small cultivators is to be prioritized over larger cultivation licenses during that initial application period. And that's already built into the implementation timeline, which we'll look at in a second. Um, they're to consider the different needs and risks of small cultivators when adopting and make accommodations where uh, appropriate. So, you know, you mentioned, I think Kyle mentioned uh, paperwork, or it could be something like around security systems. So if you have a large grow operation, maybe you would need a different type of security system than you if you had a smaller uh, grow operation. Um, and then uh, subsection D, just clarifying that a small cultivator can sell cannabis to a licensed dispensary at any time for sale to patients and caregivers. So there's a new subsection, there's a new section 8A, um, and I mentioned a little earlier just about uh, health department warnings. This is something that came in on the floor in the house on S25, um, having the Department of Health reporting to the committees on government operations regarding their collaboration with the board on the health warnings. So that's not for you to report, but just so you know that they will be reporting on that. Um, section eight is the licensing rollout. Um, this was not changed in S25. Um, so you're still um, tracked for this. Uh, so what happens in subsection A is that for dispensaries who are currently licensed, the dispensary uh, caps are lifted uh, as of February 1st of next year. Um, so for dispensaries right now, they have uh, cultivation caps and those caps are tied to the number of patients who have designated that particular dispensary as their dispensary. So patients ha can't go to any dispensary they want. When they register, if they're going to uh, use the services of a dispensary, they have to pick one so that DPS knows which one they're going to. Um, and so on February 1st, in order to open it up and have enough supply so you can start selling in the spring um, uh, for integrated dispense, the caps are lifted um, and a dispensary can start to cultivate and create products for purpose of transferring or selling them to an integrated licensee after those integrated licensees are licensed in the spring. Um, so the first uh, licenses, uh, applications would be coming in um, April 1st or after, um, and then they are to be start being licensed on or before May 1st. 
Um, and so in this, and I'll just mention there is that the first out of the gate at the same time, at this time of April 1st, it's the integrated licensees, um, the small cultivators, um, and the testing labs. Those are all of the ones um, that can start applying on April 1st and then start uh, being uh, licensed by May 1st. There's new language here with regard to the integrated licensees. You'll see the, the highlighted red language is that between August 1st and October 1st, 25% of campus flowers sold by an integrated licensee should be obtained from a licensed small cultivator if available. So assuming that, let's say if you had an integrated licensee start to uh, you know, be licensed sometime in May and then they get going and they start retail sales sometime in the summer, then in that small period of time before the other retailers come online in the fall, they would be required to be getting a quarter of their flower from, um, from small cultivators if they're able to do that. Um, the way that the rollout works is that there's like for this opening time period only is that there's kind of like a uh, you have you first you have your uh, integrated licensees, your testing labs and your small cultivators open up and then the board would start licensing them. Then there's the next period that opens up um, and that is uh, is for all cultivators. So they can start applying. Um, so the ones that are larger than the than the thousand square feet can start applying in May. Um, then you have in July, uh, product manufacturers and wholesalers can begin applying. And then September is when you uh, have the applications for retailers. And so for this initial rollout, the experience, and, and Pepper, you'll probably remember this, is that when years ago, when we were working first with Colorado and Washington, when they were kind of the only states online, one of their recommendations was to do it this way at the beginning so you don't get completely overwhelmed and have retailers that are licensed, but you don't have enough product. Um, and so this is just for the initial rollout. After this initial rollout, the board has the ability to decide how many permits when they open up permitting is it just is it is are you know is the application always open or only certain amount of time things like things like that um so as i mentioned earlier so the all of the medical laws get repealed on march 1st um these are the new ones that are in there i'm not going to go over those but they are uh, a lot there's a lot of things that have been left behind. There's a lot of requirements under the current program for patients, um, like you know having to designate a certain dispensary or um, uh, having to make an appointment with a dispensary, things like that that don't necessarily make sense when you have a have an adult use market out there where that same patient could walk into any retail store and not have to make an appointment or not pick a certain store. So those things have kind of been left behind. Um, there is, you'll see in section 10 of Act 164 was repealed by S25. That was moving over one of the, there's two sections in Act 164 that were moving the medical programs over on March 1st. Um, that's been changed and now um, everything is gonna move over on, uh, I think January 1st. Um, so I will show you that language, but you do have, you have separate chapters new, the new chapters that will, that will regulate medical and registry and the dispensaries are still slated for March 1st. And that's because the board needs time to adopt your rules because you're adopting the rules for adult use and for medical at the same time. And you're gonna be basing those on these new statutes that are dropping down on March 1st. And so they didn't want those to kind of happen before you have a chance to do the rulemaking. Um, um, I, I know that the time, I see the time, believe me, I understand. Uh, I know that a lot of what's left in the bill deals with the taxing and the use of those taxes and the prevention and um, funding. And a lot of those are not actually under the purview of the board. They've been delegated to 
um, the Department of Revenue or Department of Tax and the Department of Health and the right. Agency of Education. So um, please feel free to skip over that. I mean, maybe I think it makes sense if you have, unless you disagree, um, if you could touch very briefly on the S25 changes around sure. social equity. Yeah. Um, just, just to let folks, I mean, I, I apologize. I know that I was late today, so it's it's my fault. No, you. that's okay. It's always, you know, these are, it's there's a lot here and it's always, uh, I'm, difficult to try to get through it quickly. But um, I did just wanna mention on section 15 here, and you can see this is new language from S25, moving it over, moving the medical program over on the first. And uh, when the program transfers over, also um, that fund will transfer over. I don't know um, what kind of money is in that fund now. It usually runs at a surplus um, and is entirely self-sustaining for the program or has been to date. And then also those positions will, will transfer over to the board on January 1st. Um, also just wanna note the Medical Cannabis Oversight Advisory Panel. So again, this is new language from S25 and this is to kind of look at the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee and look at how do you kind of um, bring that into today's kind of cannabis landscape. Um, when it was first created, it, uh, it was focused a lot more on kind of law enforcement and, and things like that. And so the question is, is does the makeup of the committee, does the charge of the committee, does it still need make sense or should there be a new, um, you know, should there be new make, you know, new members, new, go new goals, new duties for, the, for them? So getting to social equity, section 11, um, this is uh, from 25, uh, directing you that when you are reporting to the General Assembly on fees, that you propose a plan for a reduced or eliminated licensing fees for individuals from communities that have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition or individually directly and personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. So reduced or eliminated fees. That was something that was mentioned by the governor in his letter uh, from 1X64. And then section 12 is establishing a new chapter in Title VII after the other cannabis chapters um, for social equity programs. Um, when we're talking about the agency, we're talking about ACCD. Uh, section 987 uh, creates the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Um, the fund is uh, comprised of monies allocated to the fund by the General Assembly and the General Assembly appropriated uh, half a million dollars for the fund um, for this upcoming year. And then it's also comprised of a one-time contribution of $50,000 per integrated license to be made on or before October 15th. And so this is something that the, so if it's a dispensary that chooses to obtain an integrated license um, then they would pay that. So you would have a potentially $250,000 coming into this fund from the existing dispensaries who want to participate as an integrated licensee. Um, the purpose of the fund is to provide low interest rate loans and grants to social equity applicants to pay for ordinary and necessary expenses to start and operate a cannabis business and to pay for outreach that can be provided or targeted to attract those social equity applicants. Uh, to assist with job training and technical assistance for social equity applicants and to pay for any necessary costs uh, for administering the funds. Um, and then D is just designated that this is a revolving loan fund. So as people pay money back into the fund that can be used to provide more loans and grants to, to new folks. So section 988 uh, is designating ACCD to develop the program using um, the Cannabis Business Development Fund for the purposes we just discussed. The agency can um, contract all or part of the necessary underwriting um, and administration services for those loans and grants. Um, and then if the agency can't do so, the program doesn't move forward until the General Assembly appropriates the resources necessary for the agency to be able to do that. Section 989 is a reporting requirement. So the board in consultation with the advisory committee, ACCD and the executive director of racial equity are to report to the general assembly um, 
uh, January 2023. So if you think about, because you got to, you'll have people applying next year, so you would have, you know, at least some experience with it uh, in 2022, and then you would report biennially thereafter regarding the implementation of the chapter, including data on the number of applicants, number of recipients, number and amounts of loans and grants, and identification of continuing barriers to accessing the cannabis market for social equity applicants. Section 13 is directing the board and consultation with the advisory committee, ACCD, and director of racial equity to develop criteria for social equity applicants for the purpose of obtaining the loans and grants. And then the board is to provide the criteria to the General Assembly not later than October 15th of this year. So that would be, you would make your recommendation and then that would be likely included in whatever legislation is introduced for the beginning of the year. Section 14 is just the, the money piece that I talked about for the appropriation. Um, I'm not gonna go over the taxes. I think generally, you know, there's a there's a excise tax. There's also a uh, sales tax, a excise tax is general fund money, but there's 30% that's earmarked for substance misuse prevention. And then the sales tax money is specifically dedicated for after school and summer programming. Um, so you can see that in section 17C. This, I think, Pepper, you had mentioned 18C. This just has to do with talking about the rollout of how dispensaries and integrated licensees can apply deductions because it may not fit within exactly a certain tax year. Um, substance misuse prevention funding. The only changes here are that it was in Act 164, it was session law, now it's been codified, and it's also uh, clarified that in subsection B, there's a balance carry forward, um, and that money should be used for purpose of funding substance misuse prevention in the subsequent fiscal year. And, um, and if there's any carry forward, um, it's in addition to revenues that are allocated for substance misuse prevention programming. It's not like a subs, it's not like you can go back and substitute and say, well, we don't have to appropriate as much. I think that about- That about it? it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I really appreciate this walkthrough, Michelle. I do have one question for kind of Senator Sears and, uh, Representative Copenhansis and Senator Pearson, if he's still on, which is just, um, I see the guiding principles of this bill, and Senator Sears may well start with you just as kind of the original architect, and there's a lot of them, but bringing the legacy market and small cultivators into the regulated market, social equity, environmental and land use protections, youth prevention and education, consumer protection, maintaining the continuity of services of the medical registry and highway safety. Um, and I see those as kind of our guiding principles that have been given to us as a board. Am, am I missing anything? Is there any kind of, is there anything else that we should be thinking about as we move through our, our, our next phase, which is actually, you know, sitting down and doing the work of the board? I, think, I, I, I don't think you're missing a thing. And I think you've got pretty much all of it. I will say that, for us, when we first started on this trail, one of the principles that I looked that we got hit with when we went out and did public hearings was don't allow big pot to come into Vermont. Um, and, you know, they, uh, so many people mentioned that. And so that's kind of a, the genesis of a lot of the language that you see in the bill is doing our best to write, um, to make sure that we don't get monopolized by some out-of-state corporation that's prepared to, you know, ball, and I think it was the Marlboro of pot or something like that, people called it. But uh, that's really started back in the beginning days when we started looking at, right, at tax, aid, tax on regulated markets. So I think that's the one thing you'll see as an overriding issue from, and I think it was both the governor, the both governors, Shumlin and Scott, the House, Senate, have all agreed on that particular principle. Yeah. 
Representative Copeland Hans, can you just give us any kind of last concluding thoughts if those are priorities or, or what you see are your priorities and maybe any advice you have for us as we really dig in? Yeah, I think you um, I think you hit the highlights um, really well and and I would also um, you know just add my agreement to what the senator just said. You, you know, we're it, it was important to us as we were looking at the architecture of the bill that the Senate sent over to us um, that we make sure that we're doing this um, in a Vermont way, you know, with a Vermont scale uh, recognition that we do have growers uh, out there in Vermont right now uh, who may want to get into this regulated market and uh, and really wanting to empower this board to, um, you, you know, to look at creating a, a regulated market with those ideals in mind. So. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you both. I know, I don't know if Senator Pearson is still on. If he is, please chime in. But, you know, you did this, um, both of you, without the benefit of a ballot initiative driving it forward. You had to take incredible political risks to do it. Um, you gave us uh, an incredible platform to work from. And I uh, just, have to thank you and Michelle for your tireless efforts on this. And Julie, Kyle, uh, if you want to say anything to, you know, before we turn to public comment. I'll just quickly say thank you. Ditto what Pepper has mentioned. And I think you've given us some some tools to go and protect small cultivators and, and the kind of craft experience that hopefully our marketplace will will offer um, and I'm I'm happy about that. So thank you. I don't think I have anything in addition to add. Um, I you know agree with with uh, Representative Copelhansis on the this kind of entrepreneurship spirit that we have in Vermont and the focus of that market. Well, thank you all so much. I, I'll let you drop off. I know that you know you just came out of essentially a 15 month continuous session and here you are doing a walkthrough of a bill for an hour, an hour and a half. Um, but uh, we are going to turn to public comment and just thank you one last time for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. OK. Um, so with thank that, you, Michelle. <laughs> The next item on our agenda is public comment. We're going to then move to a short break um, and kind of dig into what we just heard afterwards. So, um, Nelly, could you just kind of manage the public comment? And I see David Silberman has got his hand raised. And for the for just for the folks on the phone, um, for the folks that are joining us through the link, please just raise your hand, your virtual hand. Um, uh, for the folks on the phone, I'll turn to you after all the other folks have, and you just hit star six to unmute. So, David, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Pepper. Um, I, I want to just um, build on what Senator Sears said about uh, Big Pot uh, and uh, how this bill um, uh, works to counteract that impact. Um, you know, we have in here the strictest set of ownership limits of any law uh, in any state in the country. Uh, we only allow uh, a licensee to own or control one license, whether directly or through affiliates. And, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, in the legislature working on that language uh, over the course of, of several legislative sessions, going back to uh, 2016. And uh, that language was worked on and refined and refined to the point where, where it talks about uh, beneficial ownership, not just record ownership, uh, and talks about uh, other indicia of control, um, almost like a securities law definition of control, uh, where you can look to even contractual rights. Um, and I think this is going to be another very powerful tool for you guys to keep this market small and locally controlled. Um, and there's going to be room for uh, important rulemaking here as you think about what is control uh, and, and what it is that you're going to require folks to disclose in their applications to you 
so that you can make sure that folks really are complying with these requirements and are not working through various affiliated entities or, or you know, nominees or other kind of shell holding uh, uh, structures to evade these rules. Um, so, uh, you know, having those disclosures, I think, is something that, you know, if you look at Massachusetts' experience, w was a big problem. Um, they, they uh, you know, I've heard uh, Shalene Title talk about this uh, a bit, uh, but they had issues finding out who the real people behind the licensees are. Um, and, and I think here you have the tools you need to force those disclosures. And I would just urge you to be really aggressive about that and, and, and make sure that you protect the prerogative uh, that the legislature took here um, to say that, you know, we really do want to limit it and not allow corporate consolidation within the industry in Vermont. Uh, so while we'll be able to have folks come in from out of state and have big multi-state operators come in, they're going to be limited to that one store or that one grow operation or the one manufacturing facility. And that way, everyone else uh, has a level playing field and isn't crowded out by, you know, economies of scale. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for your advocacy on Act 164. Um, <clears throat> Jocelyn? Hi, thanks so much for having us here today. Um, I just quickly wanted to mention a few things after you guys ran down S25. You know, I appreciate being a little more thoughtful about the medical programs funding. I think this is the first time we actually have an opportunity to use that money to benefit patients. I don't think that's something that the program has addressed in the past is we actually have a fund that can help make this program better for patients. So I want to just reiterate that that money I'm hoping can really stay with medical patients. I think there's a lot of ways we can support medical patients from educating the staff that's at the dispensary. I think something very common we often hear, and I know I hear from patients is that there isn't as much medical expertise or knowledge amongst the staff in the dispensaries that patients could use to feel more supported, or that money could go to have actual medical professionals in the dispensaries available for patients. So I think that's one thing that can set us apart. I wanna quickly mention just on the THC caps and that discussion, I just wanna keep asking everybody to continue to remind themselves that not, not all people using adult use or recreational are not patients. They can be using medicinally. When we think of veterans, we know a lot of them don't have access or are worried to lose their benefits. When I think of nurses and professionals like myself, I understand why people are hesitant to put their name into a system that says they're using cannabis. And when we look at single parents, you know, just a few reasons people might not wanna be a patient, but they are using medicinally. And I think those patients should have the opportunity to have concentrates and to have more access to product than just medical patients that have the opportunity or the availability to get that medical card. Again, we have to remember there are people who are literally worried about their life benefits if they sign and put their name on a medical card. And I also encourage us to consider allowing patients to use every dispensary. So even the adult use dispensaries because they really need more options. One thing very unique to cannabis medicine is that we have different strains or cultivars, chemovars, whatever language you wanna use. It's not like here's a Prozac or here's a Zoloft pill, that's standard. One person might find one strain or cultivar, and I know this from a very personal you know, medical necessity myself, and not every dispensary is gonna be able to have those options. So patients being able to shop without paying extra taxes at the adult use market, not only support the local farmers, but it's supporting patients to have more options. And when we look at um, patients, the last thing I wanna mention is consumer safety, because I feel like it's one thing, I know there's a one or two liner in Act 164, but it doesn't address a lot of the lab testing moving forward. And I'm really hopeful that that's gonna be a bigger part of the conversation. Because if we wanna look at having a good program, a safe program, we have to look at clean cannabis. And we do know that's one area that the medical program in Vermont currently could do a lot better as far as having that third party and that contaminant testing. We know that the hemp program has put together some good recommendations, but unfortunately those are only recommendations. They're not not being mandated. So from both a medical professional and a patient standpoint, I just want to continue 
to hopefully see that conversation happen, happen more is the consumer safety aspect from that lab testing. So I appreciate the rundown on S25. I just wanted to touch on a couple things um, that I felt like mentioning after that. So thank you again. I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you, Jessalyn. Are there any other folks uh, that want to speak that have joined through the link that can raise their virtual hand? OK, are there any folks on the phone that want to provide comment? And now and again, if you would like to, you're currently muted, hit star six to unmute. OK, um, well, what do we have a 10 minute break scheduled? So um, why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute break? Um, why don't we why don't we come back at 1250? Does that work? Sounds yep. good. OK. 50 for the record. Um, our next agenda item is to look at the board policy areas and uh, you know. Oh, sorry, we're recording now, right? Let me just start over. 1250, we're back. Our next agenda item is to look at the um, policy areas um, that we saw in Act 164 and S25 and <clears throat> think about dividing them up. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I have some hesitation in getting too deep into the board's work before we have an executive director in place. Um, and that hesitancy uh, is just in the, you know, the executive director is the one that needs to translate a lot of the work that we do into rule, into statute. Um, and so um, anything that we do now, we'll have to play, our executive director will have to play catch up later. Um, but given um, what we did today, um, I think that it makes sense to start the conversation about how we want to proceed as a board and how we want to go about tackling um, just the huge amount of work uh, that we're going to have to do, you know, prior to October 1st, and then in order to meet subsequent deadlines beyond that. So um, <clears throat> I'm happy to kind of open it up for discussion um, with you, Julie and Kyle, um, to think about uh, the best way to proceed. Um, and I can just give you a quick overview of sort of my thinking on this, which is there are express legislative intent in the in Act 164 um, and S25, and then there's sort of implied legislative intent based on some of the provisions that are in there. And I kind of listed them for our guests this morning, what I thought they were. Um, and it seemed to me like th that was kind of what they thought as well. So I'm wondering um, if it makes sense for us to kind of walk through those um, and maybe try to assign specific areas to specific board members so that we can kind of take the lead on um, those aspects of the bill. And um, that way, you know, because we are a three member board, because, you know, anytime we communicate with one another outside of um, kind of administrative planning and things of that nature, um, we need to do it in the context of an open meeting. That would give us the ability to work on some of these priorities um, kind of independently and tee them up for when we come together at our board meetings. So that sounds like a good plan to me. Maybe you could list them off again, uh, Chair, just for anyone who joined. I don't know if anyone joined during the break. So um, I think what I heard, and this is in no specific order, um, but prioritizing the legacy market in small cultivators and bringing them into the regulated market, um, prioritizing social equity and social equity applicants, um, energy, environmental, and land use issues, uh, youth prevention and education, 
consumer protection, uh, maintaining um, the continuity of services for the medical use program. And then highway safety is on there um, only because you can see a lot of the um, kind of the the later sections of Act 164 um, really, uh, you know, go into highway safety protections, but I actually don't know if that's really under our purview so much as it is under the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council and the Department of Public Safety. Um, so I don't know how much we as a board need to focus on that. Certainly, if we think about things down the road, um, like on-site consumption um, or specialized special event licenses, that will very quickly come to the forefront of issues that we need to consider. But um, I, I don't know if we need to assign that one today or if we need to assign any of them today. I mean, I think we should we could think about that. Um, and then just another, uh, you know, another issue that, that comes to mind is, you know, in the, the section that creates the board, you know, the, the express language is that, you know, this board is being created for the purpose of safely, equitably, and effectively implementing and administering the laws, enabling access to adult use cannabis in Vermont. I wonder, and again, I don't know how much of this has to happen in rulemaking or how much we can do on our own, uh, but I'm wondering also if we wanna take some time to define what that means safely, equitably, and effectively. Yeah, I agree. I think we should take some time. I think, you know, what can really help us as a board and, and the public as they interact with us is developing a, a mission statement um, or something of that nature that kind of gets to the fundamental principles with which we intend to operate. Yeah, I think so too. And um, when we have an executive director, maybe they can help us figure out um, mm -hmm. whether those need to be put into rules or legislative intent language, or, or I don't even really know. But um, I think it would make sense for us to exactly have something that as we're making decisions, we can kind of refer back to as our touchstone. Um, so we don't have to do that now, but I do think that it's something that um, we should be thinking about. And maybe if we think about dividing up some of these um, kind of underlying principles to specific board members, maybe it'll make sense if, if we want to kind of divide up, you know, at least the initial thoughts on drafting um, what safely, equitably and effectively mean. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. If we kind of took each area um and drafted something we could maybe go over it in our next meeting and that would be a jumping off point yeah so then you know if these are our kind of guiding principles i also think that what sort of makes sense is to um think about maybe having you know week-long meetings on each one and it you know it's probably beneficial to us again to have an executive director to have our advisory committee in place um before we get too far down any one path but i do think that now might be a good time for us until we have those um to maybe just hear um from some organizations that specialize in, in these areas um but <clears throat> again i don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves um but I don't know, uh, do you want to kind of just break up some of these issues and, you know, each one, the reason why I chose these kind of overarching kind of principles is because I think there's reporting requirements or work that we have to do in service to each one of them. And so while I don't have the specific statutes uh, laid out for each one, um, you know, if we start to try and break up some of these and there's going to be intense overlap between all of them and mm -hmm. uh, interconnectivity, but maybe if we break up some of these, maybe we can each individually go through Act 164 and S25 and find the areas that uh, relate to these issues. Um, 
you know, not not today, but kind of in our own own time. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you I, think? I just yeah. interrupt for a second, Mr. Chair. It would be a good idea to look at those legislative priorities and maybe crosswalk them with some of the the kind of hard deadlines that we have. Sure. And set yeah. those, you know, use those as guideposts for the, um, you know, what we prioritize. Yeah. I, oh. Absolutely. <clears throat> Because I think what Michelle was sharing with us and, and in looking at the legislation, right, so the, the deadline that's already passed, April 1st, right, was I think most of those um, issues were around environmental and land use, energy efficiency, permits and licensing, the food manufacturing and the advertising. Yeah. So I wonder if we might kind of consider that alongside of those legislative intents and go from there. I, th I think so, too. Um, yeah, so I agree. do we want do we want to assign that just to one of the board members as the kind of coordinator for that? Because obviously we have to work with the Public Utility Commission. We have to work with um, the Public Service Department um, by statute. But then, of course, there is a number of experts in this state, um, you know, and organizations that have extreme expertise and knowledge of those areas. So it might be best if we kind of designate one person to be the point person. And then, like I said, we'll do like a week of energy environmental land use to just kind of get oriented and then, you know, receive comment and try and, um, and hopefully we will have a executive director in place that can kind of then help um, with that. But why don't we just start with environmental energy and land use? Um, and I would, take any suggestions from either of you if anyone has a spe specific interest in kind of running point on that. I'm I'm happy to to do so. I know the three of us have kind of talked <laughs> that we each bring certain backgrounds to the board. I would submit that uh, my specifically tailored legal education and experience might might help lend an ear to those types of issues that we're going to be facing. Um, that being said, I know that we've also talked about just because we come from a certain background and have a certain level of expertise in all of the different issues that we're going to be working on that doesn't preclude other board members from having an interest in those areas. So I'm happy to kind of coordinate um, those issues. I think they're really important. I think a lot of people, especially after S25, likely have their ear or their eyes towards that October 1st deadline as it relates to fees, fee structures, licensing, licensing structures. But all of these issues are going to help inform how we're going to start really moving forward with, with structuring licenses and fees because energy usage is going to look different depending on the size and scale of an operation, whether it's indoor or outdoor, same with environmental issues, groundwater issues. Um, you know, we can really jump down that that rabbit hole. But I think if we are going to work towards a lot of our deadlines in 2022, we really need to start um, getting as much clarity for folks that are planning to put plants into the ground as quickly and expeditiously as we possibly can to make sure that there, there isn't um, any shortfalls or or you know missteps in 2022 as we look to make sure that the market, the supply and demand kind of equalize each other out and, and we have a successful launch of this program. So the long and the short of it is I'm happy to 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 take that, Mr. Chair, if 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 you would like me to. Absolutely. And thank you for that. Um, and it's going to be, you know, as you mentioned, just so instructive on how we structure our licenses and fee structure. So yeah. Um, Kyle, uh, in looking at the I'm kind of combining items on the agenda right now only because we're running a little bit behind schedule, but in looking at the um, advisory committee, um, if you wanted to kind of appoint a subcommittee of those members, and you know this goes to you as well, Julie, um, which ones uh, do you think make the most sense? And I I'll just for the benefit of people watching, um, a few people have been named um to our advisory committee um but uh i think you know the vast majority of them have not been named at this point so uh 
you know, we're talking kind of theoretical advisory committee based on the expertise that's laid out in S25 and Act 164. So just for a point of clarification for myself, I know that um, when Michelle walked through um, 164 with us earlier, you know, there's the energy piece and then there's the environmental groundwater agricultural issue piece with the Secretary of Natural Resources, Secretary of Agriculture. Um, we're, we're, and because I think the way, and I don't have 164 in front of me anymore, but I think directly underneath that there was kind of a, um, a report or recommendation that we would be provided with each one of the kind of two prong combined into one larger recommendation is that is that correct if you if you both can recall off the top of your head yes if that's the case if that's the case anyways then that and looking at the advisory committee i think we would need in that uh, subcommittee the uh, um the chair of the public service commission um secretary of agriculture or designee i know we've received gave some from agriculture already secretary of uh, natural resources um and out. I don't have it in front of me anymore, and I apologize for that. Um, whoever, it's easy to say whoever else makes the most sense to have in in that kind of um, role. I guess, you know, another thing that we need to discuss is do these subcommittees strictly come from members of the advisory committee, or or would we, or would a coordinator invite a a expert or organization in the greater Vermont community to help? participate in these subcommittees? So the members um, that are uh, named in our advisory committee um, are either state employees or private citizens. Private citizens um, were, are entitled to um, mileage reimbursement and a per diem. Um, so I think people within the state, um, the state government, uh, would are more than willing, in my experience, to help out and, and offer technical support uh, for us. But we need to be careful about um, members of the public only because um, we're not going to be able to provide them with a per diem. Um, and you know, most, most yeah. people have a day job that they can't just drop to, to do this work. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think the three of us agree that that public input is going to really form the foundation of what we're trying to do. And I think one of the ways we can kind of uh, thread that needle or walk that tightrope is, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chairman, each each week, what's the flavor of the week? Is it energy this week? Invite certain organizations or folks that are relevant in this state and at the national level as well, or have experience in doing this with other states to come and speak with whether it's the sub, a subcommittee meeting or or the a board meeting more broadly and, and engage the public in, in that respect and then have the subcommittee um, you know go over certain recommendations thoughts perspectives that are that are offered in in that type of structure yeah yeah and um, going back to your question mr. chair for this particular subcommittee probably um, the person with municipal experience, um, just because there are probably a lot of local rules that might be impacted. And then maybe either someone with um, expertise in women or minority owned business ownership or um, social justice, just so that equity continues to be sort of the thread that ties everything together. Yeah, and it's going to, I agree. And it's, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging. I know that, I know that We've all said this today and, and other times that everything is so intertwined. It's going to be hard. It's easy to stumble down. Oh, this person should be in this subcommittee. This person should be in this subcommittee. This person should be in this subcommittee. So we just got to figure out where the, excuse me, where the fine line is to kind of put a line in the sand and, and kind of work in, work in, um, you know, work in subcommittees as, uh, as, as we can while still recognizing that there's going to be a lot of cross um, collaboration between these committees to make sure that all of these recommendations kind of fit together like a puzzle without any missing pieces. And I, I suspect we may need to amend this over time, right? We may get into a subcommittee and realize that we're missing some expertise and need to pull someone in or maybe, you know, something like that. And as our work shifts, we'll probably have to change how our subcommittees are comprised, right? So, right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that another kind of looming deadline that we have um, that is, you know, important 
to all of us is maintaining the continuity of services and diversity of products and integrity of the medical registry. Um, I'd like to take that on um, unless anyone feels strongly about doing it. I feel strongly about it, but I won't. I, <laughs> I'll acquiesce to you. <laughs> um, so for that, uh, again, just looking at the um, advisory panel, um, it's hard to know without knowing, you know, exactly, you know, when you see a member with expertise in public health or, you know, ex expertise in laboratory science or toxicology, it's hard to know specifically what that's going to mean. Um, I guess, uh, I guess I will just for now take laboratory science and uh, toxicology. Um, given what we've heard um, from Jesslyn and others. Um, I think. So just just for a point of clarification, I believe S25 amended 164 to not. We need to hit here by July 1 from all of points of contact informing the advisory committee, correct? So mm -hmm. that's right. I know that I know that we still know who the 14 members generally what buckets they'll be or what expertise they'll be bringing to us. Um, but recognizing that we don't know ex specifically who those folks are, it's still going to be kind of uh, um, let's see what we can get done over the course of the next month, recognizing that a lot of those spots are still empty. That's right. <clears throat> So I think, what did I say? I think we have four names that have been named um, at this point. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, I've seen, you know, the Social Equity Caucus received an email from the Speaker of the House requesting um, recommendations for the appointments um, for that uh, that office is in charge of. Um, I've reached out to all the appointing authorities uh, and just reminded them of uh, this, um, you know their authority to appoint and the date has changed a little bit they were all operating under kind of a may 1st deadline but you know we had missed that at that point already um so but i do anticipate us having these names um by july 1st and hopefully before mm -hmm. um so the medical registry i think it also of course makes sense to the chair of the cannabis for symptom relief oversight committee or designee and the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Okay. And now, <clears throat> I mean, the social equity piece, um, I think, you know, deserves immediate attention. Um, Julie, do you mind? I'd be happy to take that on. Okay. Mm -hmm. And back to a point. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. No, I I was going to refer back to something that you mentioned previous and just um, make sure we don't forget to mention it. And so why don't you. Don't forget to mention. So, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. I was I was just I wanted to mention that obviously you mentioned earlier that there is organizations, coalitions, experts that we want to start hearing from now that we're kind of um, moving more into the substance and business of the board and, and hopefully we can start to line up some folks to come and speak with us next week and in and, and the weeks following. Um, I know certain organizations focus on certain issues, others have more of a broad focus, some have formed coalitions, you know, the list goes on. So just wanna make sure that we, we take the time to um, find some time to schedule them to come in and, and, and speak with us. Yeah. And I think the sooner we do some of that outreach, the better. Um, and so, 
you know, once we have kind of just a rough outline of um, kind of the work that we're dividing up, I would encourage um, both of you and myself included to think about who those experts are that we can call in if we're going to do, you know, for instance, next week, a week on um, prioritizing, you know, the legacy market and small cultivators who we would want to reach out to to come help us talk to us about it. Um, and just for the benefit of people watching, um, we're tentatively um, going to schedule a meeting uh, for next Thursday um, from the kind of nine to two area, depending on uh, people's availability. Um, we are still waiting uh, to adopt a regular meeting schedule until we have an executive director. Um, and the reason for that just is, you know, we don't know what kind of time constraints uh, the executive director will have. And we also want to optimize uh, the public's ability to join these meetings. Um, so as soon as we have that decision made, then we're going to uh, adopt a regular meeting schedule. Um, but um, and our intention is to kind of formulate an agenda on Friday and hopefully get it posted by Monday for this for next week's meeting. Um, but um, Julie, if you want, were thinking about a subcommittee um, or um, generally speaking, social equity issues, and you know, it's a tough one because we've been advised by. Susanna and others to take a very broad view of social equity. Um, so, but um, if you just had kind of a first go at a subcommittee, do you know who you would want on there? Um, the person with expertise in social justice and equity issues. Um, if we haven't already assigned, I've lost track of who we've assigned and who we have not. Um, Uh, the person with expertise in criminal justice reform. And then maybe the um, person with business management. Um, and I think that's every or and the winner. Yep, sorry, go ahead. No, I was no, keep going. I, I was just going to mention something at the end. Um, I think that I was, I think I was done. Okay. Uh, the only thing I was going to mention is things along the lines of definition of social equity applicant and some of the technical assistance in business management and training. Um, you'll, you know, be required, you know, by statute to work with um, the director of racial equity, um, ACCD, uh, DOL, probably Department of Labor and D Department of Corrections. So um, whenever we start that work, you know, the, they, someone from those organizations should be involved as well. Yep, absolutely. Well, this is um, certainly a good place to start. Do, do we want to do just one more that kind of prioritizing legacy market and small cultivators? I, you know, the, that's um, clearly um, a driving motivation behind this bill. Um, is that something we should take on as a as a board or something that we should assign as a subcommittee? It probably makes sense to do it as a board. Because um, so, I see that going to each of the things we just discussed, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Yeah, and I think we all bring a certain level of of interest and understanding and expertise to that that important part of, of what we're going to accomplish. I think that authorizing legislation gives us a lot of tools and I want to make sure that we're all working in, you know, on the same up when upward beat um, when it comes to figuring out how to utilize them um, the right way. Well, then um, for that one in particular, I would just um, encourage you both and I'll do the same to just really think about who um, who we should hear from uh, and you know maybe that's a good topic to do next week um, just you know I doubt we'll have our executive director in place by then but it's I think it's a good one to kind of start thinking about what barriers exist um, 
and what we need to do to accommodate um, the legacy market. Mr. Chair, uh, circling back, I pulled up S25 and I just wanted to, to tease out a little bit more on who I think would make for um, a, a good membership on the subcommittee for energy, environmental and land use yeah. issues. Um, I know I, I mentioned Secretary of Agriculture. Um, um, I, I think somebody with expertise in the cannabis industry makes a lot of sense here as well. Secretary of Natural Resources or designee, I think I mentioned that one. Right. And um, again, you're, you'll, you will be or we will be required by statute to work with the Public Service Department and the Public Utility Commission. Right, right. right. Yeah, I, re I recognize now that they're not explicitly mentioned as it relates to the advisory committee, but they will certainly play a, a big role in helping us understand the intended and unintended aspects of, of how we structure this. Right. Well, I think, I think that's a good sorry, sorry, one more. Sorry, one more. Sorry, yeah. one, more. one member yeah. with an expertise in business management or regulatory sure. compliance appointed by the treasurer. Yeah. And, you know, Kyle, as you think about this, I think your initial instinct is correct that trying to lump together environmental energy and land use and groundwater all into one subcommittee is is not gonna you know it's gonna be just i think too much um so definitely kind of and if you want to hand off one aspect of that or, or multiple to either julie or me please feel free um yeah let's see how it rolls yeah and i think we're all working towards a common goal and we're very it seems collaborative so i am happy to be forthright if if it's not if the puzzle is not fitting together in that specific area of what we're trying to accomplish okay yeah i mean again you know i hate to just be a broken record but all of these issues are so intertwined and they're so they're all going to determine kind of our licensing structure so it's hard to really be um kind of not knowing what each other are doing um you know so you know we will have to you know this is only designed to allow us to get to work while we while we're outside of public meetings and when we come together we'll have issues teed up that uh you know you can bring information to us and then we can kind of think about um, how the whole puzzle fits together agreed well i i i really do think that's a good starting point for for us and um again we'll get together um, and draft an agenda this Friday for our next meeting, and hopefully it'll be dedicated to one of these issues, um, and we can hear from witnesses. Um, <clears throat> you know, the I'd like to open a public comment before we do. Um, just an update on our executive director. Um, so we, at our last at our meeting last Thursday met with our finalists, um, you know, we decided to, I guess, sleep on the decision about who we wanted to advance as our, our absolute finalist, our final candidate. Um, we met uh, yesterday uh, to discuss that as a group um, in executive session of an open meeting. Um, we ag all agreed unanimously on who the candidate should be. And I've reached out to that person uh, uh, that that candidate's going to join us in an executive session um, so that we can uh, make a conditional offer, um, you know, negotiate a, a salary, and um, there's a few in a in a start date. Um, there's a few administrative details that need to be worked out on the back end before we can make a final offer. Um, as soon as we have a final offer accepted. Um, we will announce who that candidate is and um, and then we can really, you know, get to work on, um, you know, starting the process of drafting rules and um, starting to form the structure of this. And then, uh, you know, the, we've been holding off, I think I mentioned in our last meeting, we've been holding off on interviewing um, or kind of requesting um, 
I guess, bids for a consultant until we saw what the exact skill set and expertise of our executive director was going to be. So um, as soon as we have that uh, candidate in place, uh, we'll move to a consultant and um, hopefully that organization or person will be able to help fill in some of the blanks of whether the you know missing expertise on the advisory commission or committee and um, you know market analysis and some of the kind of more nuanced aspects to the industry. Anything um, Kyle you or Julie would like to add? Nope. No, oh, thank you. Okay. Um, well, at this point, um, I'd like to open it to public comment. Um, for again, I'll just for those of you who have joined through the link and have a little um, hand, a digital hand that you can raise, um, please do that. And then it, anyone on the phone, I think I see one person on the phone. Um, I'll move to you after all the people that have joined through the link um, have had an opportunity. So if anyone wants to mention anything, please just raise your digital hand at this point. Uh, Jesslyn. Hi, sorry to speak again, but if no one wants to take time to public comment, I definitely um, always have something to share or ask. So the one thing I didn't mention last time, and I think I've mentioned this possibly to you, uh, Commissioner, is just recognizing that the Symptom Relief Oversight Committee is a committee that does not necessarily include representation for caregivers and cultivators. It is typically representation for patients who've been appointed by a dispensary and those patients are the people that do have that privilege to financially afford that. So when I look at social equity, I do think about you know, us considering patients and the financial feasibility. So I wanted to maybe throw out there and mention that whoever is on the advisory committee from that symptom relief oversight committee might be a good person to be on that social equity committee as well. Because I do, like I said, just want us to continue to look at the financial feasibility of patients and how that unfortunately can be a social equity issue and the present makeup of the committee, which I do think in the future is hopefully going to be looked at and possibly changed a little bit to include more of those voices, which include cultivators and caregivers. And I, you know, I put myself out there as a perfect example of a single mom nurse that tried to use the dispensary system and couldn't afford to do that. So really lean on cultivating for my own medicine. And I like to help other people in that aspect because of the financial um, difference for their medicine. So. Well, Jesslyn, just in response, you know, I the advisory committee, as I mentioned, you know, they get a per diem and it's not, you know, necessarily fair for us to ask people in your position or, you know, parents, people that are employed, uh, you know, full time to come help us out. But I do really want um, your voices at the table. So, um, yeah, we'll find we'll find a way to try and, you know, take the comments that you're giving us and incorporate them into whatever all the work we're doing. Thank you. Any other comments from um, from the public, from the people that have joined via the link? OK, anyone um, on the phone? And again, to unmute it currently, you have to hit star six to unmute. I, I hear someone. Hi, so. my name's Barry. You, you go me? ahead. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you so much for your service. I am very encouraged by your statements of commitment to small growers and consumer protections. Consumer protections are a very and vital part, you know, part of what we're going to be doing um, in our community. We have failed to protect our medical patients for years now. This is mainly due to no third party testing. Um, there is no one. You know, we've we've got we've let the fox watch the hen house for years now. There's no one looking at how the big five are producing their products or what they're actually giving to medical patients. Um, I honestly feel very bad 
for someone who is sick enough that they can't cultivate their own and have to go to one of these dispensaries. I encourage them to find seeds and find a caregiver as soon as possible and stop giving their money to the big five. Um, we have an incredible opportunity, an incredible opportunity to create a craft community that rivals our craft beer community, one that continues to recycle the money time and time again through our economy. Along with this huge opportunity comes incredibly huge challenges. Some of the biggest challenges are gonna be for the micro and macro businesses that we all know are the hardest ones to create. These are the people who have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. These are the people who have been living in the shadows for years keeping the plants alive and trying their best to stay out of the public view. We are now being told to voice our opinions. It's hard. I'd like to touch real quick on David Silverman's comment, and I believe it was Senator Sears about the Marlboros of the pot industry, the big, big, big companies. They're already here. Cure Relief, multi-state organization under the Alliance of Vermont Patient, under the alias of Vermont Patient Alliance, is building a 13,000 square foot facility in Moortown. <clears throat> it's hard to compete with that. I understand that there's statutory regulations that have been put into place in Act 164 and S54. It gives them incredible advantages. I also understand that they have to buy 25% of their products from a small cultivator. But if their price is set so low that it doesn't cost, it doesn't cover cost of production, then all they have to say is we couldn't source the product. And who is going to be watching if they actually buy that 25%? Uh, you guys talked about a touchstone. I think a touchstone, and I sent a public comment in written about this, but I think one of the touchstones we should all rely on is, you know, every decision we make, every process, every, 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 we should ask ourselves, how does this affect the smallest of the small growers? How does this affect our micro and macro businesses, our entrepreneurs who want to build businesses and want to continue to thrive in our communities? How will this decision affect them? Uh, I want to go real quick. I know you guys are running behind. I just want to go real quick on the S54 comments. Uh, the advisory committee appointment from the Vermont Trade Association, it's a representative from the five, from the big five. Um, that was originally supposed to be somebody from the craft community, and it was changed at the last minute. We are not happy about that. Uh, I'd like to just remind you guys that whoever that person is, their comments are going to be pers pursuant of that opinion. Um, you know, everything that comes out of their point of view is going to be for those companies. Fee structures, you guys are, you guys are clothed in the men's power. You know, um, fee structures, rules, business plans, all the stuff that, that you're, you know, you're tasked to do is, is, is enormous. And uh, I really, really think you have an incredible opportunity to help the small cultivator. And if the goal is to bring us into the market, if the goal is to take the black market and create a white market, then we need to do everything out, everything, everything we can, you know. We're growers. We're not business people. We don't we don't specialize in making business plans. We don't specialize in regulatory obligations. You know, and we're going to need a lot of help. You know, um, this has been tried in multiple states before that have robust economies and huge budgets. You know, you guys have to create a budget based off of fee structures. So right now, just the three of you at two hundred fifty thousand dollars in salaries. And you guys are going to hire an executive director, an executive assistant, an administrative assistant. And I'm not saying you don't need these things. I'm just saying there's a reality that you have to balance a budget, right? And, and if the fee structures are going to be so high for the craft grower, for the, for the micro and macro businesses, we're never going to get off the ground. Um, something to think about. Department of Health. And these are all things in Act, uh, S20, S54 that you guys have power over working with and changing. Department of Health working with edibles? Absolutely, yes. Once again, consumer protection, very important. Uh, should there be a minimum CBD and THC products? Absolutely no. If somebody wants a CBD product, go get a CBD product. You know, The current market for seeds and strains that are being developed don't consider how much CBD should be in the product. 
Um, we can't start breeding right now if we have a minimum CBD product in THC. We'll be three years out trying to make flowers. The THC caps, if we're trying to bring all of the black marketeers into the comp, into the, into the community, into the white market, we have to get rid of those. In Act, in Act, in uh, S54, they talk about taking a 60% THC and bring it down to compliance. They also talked about not, you know, banning additives. You cannot take a 60% concentrated THC product and bring it into compliance without adding additives. So it's a contradiction within the own, you know what I mean? It's a contradiction within the own statute. The only way to fix that is to just get rid of the, just get rid of the caps. <laughs> Bring, yeah. bring everybody into the tent. Um, All right. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. I, I just am trying to be equitable here on the time, but thank thank you for the comments. Um, and, uh, you know, we are at the very beginning of our journey. And, you know, I, I hear I hear what you're saying. I, you know, I've been listening to the testimony on Act 164 on S25, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I hear a lot of uh, these these same themes come up over and over again. So we are listening, um, but we're just so early on right now, and we'll we will be engaging with you and all other kind of organizations by, about putting this putting the small cultivators, uh, prioritizing them, putting them first, which the law actually requires us to do. So, um, are there any other uh, public comments? Okay, so we are going to be going into executive session um, again. The purpose of this is to negotiate a conditional offer um, for our executive director candidate, um, and we will be adjourning. Um, we'll come back um, into the meeting just to adjourn. So um, folks that want to drop off, please feel free. We won't be doing any more business with the board today. Um, but we will be leaving up kind of our away message uh, while we do that. Um, so um, for anyone who wants to stick around. Um, so with that, I would um, entertain a motion to move into executive session. Um, to uh, go into executive session to negotiate um, with uh, executive director candidate. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Um, Nelly, uh, if you're there, um, could you start the recording? Ah, you got it. All right. Thank got you. Got it. Okay. So we're coming out of executive session right now. It's uh, two fourteen, um, and we don't have any further business of the board to discuss today. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 OK, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You too. So you can thanks. Thanks, Nelly. No problem. See y'all later. See ya.